week 20 of Ready to Homeschool six month countdown. You can download this week's um, notes at www.hilariousHomeschooling.com. I will tell you it's very, it's a very thick packet this week. I have quite a few samples and quite a few things. You may not want to print all of those out if you are printing things out because you might not find all of them useful. So you might just want to follow along um, using the PDF on your computer and then print them out later, but whatever works for you. Okay. This week, we're going to be talking about setting up a weekly schedule. Before we go any further, I need you to know that I am probably a more structured homeschooler. Um, I know quite a few other families who do more of unschooling or very casual, flexible um, schooling, and that's fine. I'm not mad at them. I'm not judging them or anything like that, but they would find my process too much. If you are leaning in that direction of being more of an unschooler or a flexible schooler, or it just, you bend homeschool all around your life and everything, you are probably going to be annoyed by me, okay? I'm not saying that because it's bad. I'm just saying it because it's a different approach. Because academics are very valuable to me, I am, I was trained as a teacher, um, have many teachers in our history of our family. Academics has always been important in our family. It would be very hard for me to adopt the unschooling structure, the structure free approach and not do any of this. So I want you to know that from the beginning, if you stick with me and you listen to all of that um, and you want to try it, great. If it's helpful, wonderful. If it's not, it's okay. You can still homeschool using a different approach and your kids won't suffer. Okay. It's just that you might have different values for your family than I had for mine. Um, and that's okay because we talked about that back in week 17. We talked about how each family has different strengths. Also, I am going to be referencing several of our past episodes. So if you have not had time to watch the rest of the episodes, just know that there's going to be some things that I talk about that you might need to go back and watch or learn about before you're ready to do this step of setting up a weekly schedule. Okay, with all of that said, I want you to know that planning is important to me. I know that my plans are going to fail because my plans are made for the perfect day in the perfect world with the perfect children. And that doesn't exist on earth. And so I know that what I set up on paper is going to have to flex because we live in a world where there is illness. There are plans that change and get interrupted at this, a second I have kids who fight. There's phone calls. I know all of those things are going to happen, but I still aim for what I would like to have happen in theory on paper because it helps me to see that what I am aiming for could possibly fit into our days um, if there was a perfect world. And again, there's not. But it still helps for me to aim for the moon, even if I don't hit it. Um, just to have some kind of a goal in mind. So let me read you some verses about planning because this has been one of those areas where I tend to over plan and annoy people around me. And so I've really dug into what the Bible has to say about planning and preparing. So I want to read you three verses and um, that have been very helpful for me. The first one is in Proverbs. It's Proverbs 16, 9. And it's actually from a different version than the one that I have right here. It's from the Living Bible. And it says, we should make plans counting on God to direct us. And I really like that because the writer of the Proverbs is pointing out that making plans often turns out better than not making plans. But our plans need to be coming from God in the first place. So listening for what God has for you and then making plans according to that um, usually works out a little bit better. Um, James 4 also has something to say about plans. James 4 says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. 
As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. This is a really good reminder that the plans that we are making are still subject to what God has for us. God can change the course of our life in a heartbeat and the things that we put down on paper may never come to pass. That has been true for many, many, many people over many, many, many years. And that's not going to change just because we're homeschooling this year. So remembering that God still has the final say in how you are going to spend your next year is very helpful to avoid pride and arrogance and haughtiness. That does not mean we should not make any plans. One of my other favorite verses is in the book of Ezra. Ezra was a teacher for God's people, and he was leading them back into um, the promised land after a period of captivity. And Ezra 7.10 says this, For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. Um, in the other version that I got off the computer, it said, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Um, I like the way that that version puts it because it says he had prepared his heart. This one simply said he had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord. In either case, Ezra has spent a majority of his life learning what God wants so that he can pass it on to the people underneath him. And that is what you have been doing. You have been learning what God has for you and your homeschool and your family. And you are getting ready. That's why we said ready to homeschool. This is a plan and a preparing time. But you are also preparing your heart and preparing your family and preparing your home to be a place where you can pass on the love of the Lord to the next generation. So think about those verses as we go through this, these different steps. Um, and remember that whatever you put on paper can be changed and it probably will be changed. And not to lose heart because of that, but to still go ahead and make some plans and make some preparations and um, think about what you do want to accomplish and get it down on paper. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is I am just going to talk through these 14 steps. Um, I have some handouts that go with eat most of the steps, but some of them refer back to other episodes. So we're just going to talk through them, okay? The first one is to look over a calendar for the next school year. Um, I didn't bring one of those down here, but usually what I end up doing is simply printing off the internet. Um, like this year, I will print off fall of 23 and spring of 24. That's our academic year from August until May. And so I will just print off a calendar from the internet just that has the dates because I kind of have some ideas of what plans we already have in place. Um, we will have two kids in college this next year, which means that I kind of like to plan around their breaks because that means that they might be home with us for that week. And that would be a week that I don't want to do homeschool then because we just want to soak in our time with our older kids. Um, we have a daughter living overseas and we've talked about making a trip to go see her. Well, that would definitely be a two to three week trip. And if that happens, I'm going to block those weeks off um, on a calendar to just show that we're not homeschooling those weeks. We may take a book or two with us, but I'm sure not going to assign a whole bunch of lessons um, while we're on a, a trip overseas. So you are going to try to look at that calendar that has the next academic school year in it and kind of get a feel for, are you taking breaks off for Christmas? A lot of families do, and it's one of the wisest things you could do is to take three weeks off, four weeks off at Christmas and New Year's, um, take a break, stretch your legs, enjoy the holidays together, maybe do a few other types of lessons that have to do with Advent, but not to be a serious homeschooler in December, and then hit it hard again in January. Um, some people, uh, know that they're expecting a baby sometime in the next academic year. Okay, well, that's going to change the time at, when the baby comes is going to change your intensity and your homeschool plans. So just know that and block off four to six weeks for a time for the family to readjust and welcome a new baby and um, figure out how to do life with an additional family member. Um, so summer, some families like to homeschool all year long. Some families like their summer breaks and guard it carefully. So um, some families just like to have a lighter schedule during the summer where they still keep a few subjects um, 
um, we're going to do math throughout the summer so that my kids don't lose that ability um, and their skill level. Okay, that's number one. Number two is a question for you to just pencil in over here. How many days do you have to do school? In Iowa, we are legally required to do 148 if we are um, in a homeschool assistance program or dual enrolled. The public school kids are required to do 178. So already the state is acknowledging that having one-on-one -on -one private instruction allows you to cut down on the number of days of school that you need. But 148 is in the back of my mind. And I am aiming for that number because that is what is expected of me. Next is another question. Would you prefer to do a four-day week, a five-day week, or a six-day week? A lot of families choose a four-day week so that they can have a day free for field trips, or maybe there's a day of the week that the dad or the um, working spouse has off, and that is a day that's no school. Um, maybe they just have somewhere that they want to go um, shopping or something like that in the middle of the week. So a lot of families do a four-day-a-week option. But that means if you're trying to hit your required number um, of school days for the government or whoever else you're accountable to, you're going to have to up the number of weeks that you do school to make up for that. Five-day week is what we're used to with a public school. Six-day week is possible. If you think that you want to do many intense weeks of school, six days a week, and then have some more time off um, to take breaks, that's possible then you would just plan shorter units um, for your school so that you can cram it into more days and more weeks, less weeks, more days per week. Um, and Or you could just get done faster. You could start in September and be done by maybe March. So that's a possibility. Okay, another possibility here for the more unstructured people is if you just want to list out some assignments the assignments per week, the assignments for the month, the assignments for whatever your un unit you're working on, hand your kids an assignment sheet that has the whole entire list of it and say, have this done by the end of the month. Okay, some students can do that. Some students, that's too much information, too overwhelming, and they will not plan out their time well, and they will end up not meeting your expectations, and it will not be pretty on that last day of the month. So, Think about how you want to schedule the student's assignments. If you're the one teaching it, then it pretty much has to follow uh, your schedule when you're available. If your students are old enough to be able to be on their own and independent, you can give them an assignment sheet. But what are you going to use for accountability? How are you gonna check in with them? What kind of check, um, check marks are you gonna have in place for them to check in with you and say, this is how far I've gotten and for you to say, okay, you need to step it up next week or something like that. So that is just an idea. All right, number five, we're finally getting to some of my other papers. The yearly overview sheet. Um, I am calling this one sample A. Basically, it gives you um, a column for each student that you are homeschooling. And then down here is every possible topic that I would have in my homeschool. Never would I ever have my child do all of these subjects in a year. That would be awful for everybody. But I want to think about all of these subjects as I plan out my year so that I know what I'm emphasizing and what I'm skipping. Um, for example, your math concepts are a little bit different than math drill. Math concepts is kind of like, you know, fractions or decimals or word problems. But math drill is just those pages with 100 multiplication problems that's helping them get faster. Um, reading skills is different from literature. I would like to still do both if my kids are young, but as they get into the high school, we're probably just going to focus more on literature. Um, here I have geography along with other social science, social studies and history. Here I have science and health. Here are several different types of language arts. Uh, foreign language is something that we could throw in there. Art skill and art appreciation are two different things. Music skill and music appreciation are two different things. Life skills and chores can be added in there. If I want them to be memorizing the Bible, or if they're already in an Awana program or something like that, um, we have some memory work going. There's a Bible study, and there's PE, which 
I never seem to value as highly as the public school. Um, that's why it's at the bottom of the list, honestly. My point is, is that you are going to want to think about all of these subjects as you plan out your year, but you are not going to want to do something in every single one of these subjects. It may be that you choose something in science for the first few months and then switch over and focus on health for a few months after that. Um, it may be that you want to do all geography this year and save history for a different year. Whatever you decide to do is fine. It's your homeschool and your kids and you're thinking about what your priority is for this next year. But this paper helps me to think about it all on one page. Um, I often get overwhelmed when I look at homeschool curriculum ideas and catalogs over the summer and I want to do it all. It all looks great. But realistically, we can't do it all. We're actually going to benefit by narrowing our focus and choosing one thing or two things or three things for this year. And so just putting that on a piece of paper like this helps me to see what is my child capable of and how can I keep from torturing them and overwhelming and overloading them. Okay, also another yearly overview. This would be sample B. This is my weeks. Across the top are my subjects. Now that I've chosen which subjects I wanna focus on, this is my weeks going down to 34. Sometimes we didn't do 34 weeks of school. Sometimes we stopped at 32 or 30, depending on how many days a week we were homeschooling. But here I could kind of block out, like, what are we studying in history the first week? What are we studying in science the first week? If I had a science book or a history book, I could just open to the table of contents, see how it was divided, and then just kind of scribble down um, as I went down the page. If I have more than 36 chapters in my history book, I probably need to cut something out. If I only have 10, then I'm gonna spend two or three weeks um, for each of those chapters or units. Or I might decide to do that textbook the first semester and change to something else the second semester. And again, this is not set in stone. This is simply for you to plan out what your week's gonna look like. What pace do you wanna take your schooling at? And I always tell people, um, this paper, you could do all of it, but if you're gonna do fine, detailed lesson plans, only bite off six weeks. Your philosophy of education and your understanding of how much your kids can do in a day is gonna change, and you're gonna to want to rewrite all of your lesson plans after about week six. So save yourself some time, save yourself some effort. You can scribble all over this paper, but only do your best detailed lesson plans for about six weeks. And then after you've tried it and done six weeks of homeschooling, you're gonna be able to adapt more easily for the rest of the year, okay? So um, this is on the PDF document with my um, Hilarious Homeschooling website. So you can print this off if you'd like one. It's got history, science, art, music, writing, math, PE, field trip, and other. And again, we didn't do something in all of these subjects every single week. And notice I did not include um, reading. I might have some literature. I think what I ended up doing is crossing this off and making it literature. But some of those things are covered more individually. And this is, I usually group it with all of my kids learning the same history and the same science and the same art and same music all together. So this would be more of our group subjects. You could print one of these out again and change the subjects if you wanted to do a different overview for a different subject. All right, the next page is just me showing you one of my years that I did this for. And this happens to be for this last year right now. Um, I knew that I had to get Joshua graduated by the end of this year. And so I knew that there were a certain number of things he had to cover before we got to this right here. And this was my attempt at outlining how that was gonna happen. So he would be done with the classes that he needed to have done to graduate. Um, Jessica was doing a different homeschool curriculum. And so hers is written over here and it didn't match up exactly with what Josh and Annika were studying in their high school class. So this is just me showing you one example of how you can use a worksheet like this. Um, I always wrote in pencil at this stage because I definitely erased and um, 
move things back around as I was trying to plan out how the whole year could go. Okay. Um, number six is another question that goes with what I just said. Which subjects do you want to teach as a group? List them out. And number seven, which individual subjects are your highest priority per kid? List them. This is because if you have a child who's not reading yet, that's going to be your highest priority for that child. Maybe you have a different priority for your family. I would say from an educational standpoint, helping a child learn to read is going to be your number one priority because once they learn to read, every other subject unlocks for them. Now, if they're really struggling with reading and you need to put it off another year, choose a different priority for your child that they excel in so that they can feel good about themselves so that they can realize that they do have something to offer the world. They do have strengths and they can put their best foot forward in something else. But list out your individual subjects that are your highest priority per kid. This is going to help you when you're finalizing your weekly schedule. In a similar vein, number eight says to revisit. Okay, so we have already talked about these five different areas and the different weeks. If you are behind or haven't done these other weeks um, because you just found me, that's fine. But you are going to want to go back and rewatch these five episodes and look at these PDF documents before you finish the rest of the steps um, on this worksheet. Week four, reminder, was about a home routine. Having a schedule that has some anchors in your day like lunch or rest time or if your uh, your church always goes, uh, your family always goes to church on Wednesday nights. Those are things that are already on your calendar and you're gonna have to work around them. Um, week six has your goal sheets for each individual child. Pull those out and look at them so that you can go back and see what your highest priorities are for each individual kid. You're gonna wanna put that and incorporate that in your homeschool day or in chores and life skills, which is the next topic. Week seven, chores and life skills, how are you going to plan to get chores and life skills done during your day? And does one of your children need to spend more of their day learning a certain life skill or possibly having a part-time job? That's going to affect your weekly schedule. Week 10 is outlets. When you had um, kids who have uh, interests like music or karate or um, another church ministry or a part-time job, or job shadowing somebody, or interning, um, or maybe you're involved in a ministry together as a family. All of those things are going to affect your weekly schedule, so you want to go back and look at those. Maybe you don't even have them on the calendar yet, and in that case, you would have to wait until later in the fall, well, later in the summer at least, if you get the schedule from whatever they're joining, gymnastics or dance or whatever. You're going to want to wait and see those calendars from the other outside groups if you're committed to them already. And then week 17 is family strengths. Um, we were talking about what your family values and what your family's good at. And maybe you need to add something to the schedule that corresponds with that before you start making your homeschool plan. Again, remember your schedule can change um, and adapt to whatever you do add in in the fall, but then you're doing this work twice. So that is why I encourage you to go back and get some of those things revisited, settled in your mind, and see how that affects your weekly schedule before you do the next parts. Um, the next parts were always tricky for me. I would always have to go off by myself for about two hours with my planner, my notes, um, the different things that I'm telling you here to compile, and just really pray and ask God what he wanted our days to look like. I don't like our days to be crazy, um, annoying, rushed, impatient. I don't like that feel or that atmosphere in my home. So I would always ask God to show me how I could accomplish what I needed to accomplish, what I needed to accomplish, not what I wanted to accomplish, what I needed, what he wanted me to do, and how I, that could fit into our days. Um, so don't, don't be nervous if this process takes you a long time, that's normal. Um, but do your thinking now before you dive into a, a new school year. Okay, now we're ready to talk about number nine, the weekly schedule. Um, it could look like something like this, where you have your anchors um, for your day over on this side, and then you can clearly see your chunks of time. From nine to noon is your prime time for schooling. 
And then again, from two to five would be another big chunk of schooling. So knowing that, um, I said that you should choose your group time blocks first. When is it that you have all of your kids at home that you want to do your group time with? If you have a child who's got a morning lesson somewhere, you can't do group time in the morning because one of your children are gone. So you need to think about when are all of your kids most likely to be home that you would be able to actually sit down and accomplish your group time at least three mornings a week. That for us is usually here, but sometimes our kids take some classes um, in the high school, the local high school, which means that we have to work around their schedule. Um, and then also you're gonna want to schedule, remember how I talked about back up on number seven, your kids, each kid has a high priority of what they need to learn and what you need to spend time with them teaching. That's gonna go on your schedule next. So first of all, your group block time. And second of all, that one subject per kid that is definitely a high priority this year. And that will change from year to year. Um, and of course, you're hoping to get more time with each kid for other subjects that aren't necessarily their highest priority, but that needs to go on the schedule first because then you can see how to work around that. Um, here are some other examples. This was from a different year. Um, we were running an antique store on Thursday, which we still are. But during that year, I would put certain things that we could get done while we were at the an antique store. Most of our craft projects um, have been done at the antique store now for several years because that's where I've started keeping our paints and um, glue gun, stuff like that. So it's all there now. Um, computer games. We had a computer at the store where we would just pop in a DVD, especially, I think we were doing Carmen San Diego that year. Um, we would do some math manip manipulatives there, maybe do a life skill project where they could work with Darren on some woodworking or something like that. Um, science experiments we could do there. And then we had some nature lot drawing lessons that we could do there too. So some of those things got moved to Thursday afternoon because they were a little more flexible and fun and needed kind of more like a workshop base. Um, notice that one of my children was going to the high school at this point, so we could only do workbooks in the morning, and we had to wait until she got home to do some of our history projects. And that was okay. It, we made it work. But that's why I'm saying you kind of need to think about what each student's going to be doing and where you can put your other subjects. Okay, this is my, this, my past year. I actually just wrote it in the back of my notebook. Um, I just kind of scheduled out where our group time could be, how I could have a meeting with each of my three kids who are still home. Um, and then in the afternoons, we would do a read aloud or watch a DVD that went with one of our curriculums. And then two of them were taking a math class at the high school and one of them was doing a math program on um, online. So that would be down here in this afternoon. Um, when they got home from school, they were supposed to be doing some chores or homework. That didn't always happen because by that time of the day, they were exhausted and ready to just be a teenager eating snacks on the couch, which is important too. Um, so some of this was idealistic, but it also gave us a good structure to start out with. And we pretty much stuck with most of it to the end of the year. Um, here is a weekly assignment sheet. So this is, this is combining the weekly schedule with assignments that you would actually write on there for each kid. What I did is I wrote it really tiny in red on a spreadsheet, what the subject was going to be during that time. And then every week I could fill it in on pencil very specifically, like um, that's, uh, so let's say it's the read aloud section right there. I would actually write which book we were reading and what chapter I wanted to do that day. Um, so this was where I could do kind of a very general overview with red and then a very specific lesson in pencil each week. And this helped um, that year. I've kind of changed my assignments sheet schedule every year or the look of it. So I'm giving you several options for what you could do. None of these have to be done. These are just all ideas. Um, when Elise was in seventh grade, I wanted her to be more independent. So I made her this assignment sheet where every subject that she was going to be doing was written on this side. And then I would hand write specifically what she was supposed to do that day. And then there was a spot for a check mark and she would get one of these each week from Monday through Friday. Um, that same year, 
I was more in charge of the three younger kids' education myself. I, they couldn't be as independent as Elise was. And so I made myself a similar assignment sheet, but it had a place for all three of the kids and I could write, handwrite their assignment in each of those blanks um, in all of these subjects. This is a lot of work. Yes, homeschooling is a lot of work. You're exactly right. But if you can keep up with giving them their assignments each week, they will eventually become more independent and learn how to do some of this work for themselves. Um, and a lot of my friends told me this was overkill. Yes, it's overkill, I know. But I already told you, I'm the kind of person who needs to have structure and see how it fits out into our week and see how to make my theory into a reality. So that's just who I am. I'm just giving you ideas. You don't have to be mad, okay? Here's another kind of assignment sheet. And this, I kind of borrowed this idea from Timberdoodle. Timberdoodle has a great um, pre-selected curriculum program that they then include an assignment book for each curriculum kit. And basically all it does is it gives a number of check boxes. So in order to finish the algebra lesson for the entire year, the algebra curriculum for the entire year, you would have to do five lessons a day. No, five lessons a week, one per day. So that is why they have five check boxes for that because that needs to be an everyday assignment. Down here, we had the where in the world is Carmen San Diego computer game. That doesn't have to be done every single day. I was trying to get them to play it once a week so they could play the geography game on the computer. And so there's only one checkbox for that because it only had to be done Thursdays while we were at the store. This worked really good for the year that we did it. Um, I only did it that year because I went to a different assignment sheet the next year. I already told you I do that every year. This one I've actually stuck with for two years. Uh, this is a Google Sheets that I could then share with them and we didn't always have to have a printout. Or I could copy and paste from one Google Sheet to another Google Sheet. Or if we skipped a week because of illness or family vacation plans, I could simply take everything and bump it down a week um, or just change the date at the top of it and it automatically changed the date for all of them. So um, this is another assignment sheet and I, I put all of these in the PDF document that you can look at so you're kind of looking at a weekly schedule and an assignment sheet at the same time, but you don't have to do all of that in one big step, okay? So we've already kind of talked about there, the weekly schedule, that the weekly schedule is your assignment sheet and your schedule at the same time. And we've talked about how some subjects are everyday subjects, some subjects are once a week subjects. In most families, your everyday subjects are gonna be reading and math. Um, you wanna be making progress in those things every day. Um, and some people say to be writing every day as well or doing something with language arts. Um, for science, we would sometimes do a two hour time block where we just got all of our science experiments done for the week because it's um, you have a little bit more energy and motivation to do two or three experiments at the same time. Whereas if you came to it in the textbook, you might just say, yeah, we're not gonna get up and work on that right now. Um, so for us, it would work better to do science once a week with our experiments. Um, same thing with art projects. Sometimes just getting an art project out once a week makes more sense. Um, so number 11 says to experiment with assignment sheets and plan your first six weeks. Like I said earlier, you're going to probably change your mind and reevaluate um, and make some changes after the first six weeks. So you just want to put enough energy in to figure out what your first six weeks look like. Um, Use an assignment sheet, use a weekly schedule, whatever you think will work for your family, but don't be afraid um, to switch after six weeks. You might even wanna plan a short vacation um, for the fall. You know, you start maybe at the beginning of August and by the middle of September, you're ready for your first break. And that's when you start to evaluate and think about if you wanna change the assignment sheets, if you wanna change the curriculum, if you wanna do one subject more or less or something like that. So really give some good attention to six weeks of plans, and then you can start to plan the rest of the year after that, how you see that, that that's going. Number 12 says you might be using purchased curriculum. You might also be using used books or free books or documentaries or YouTube or something like that. You may want to do some real life explorations or plan a field trip that goes along with what you're studying. If you are studying astronomy, 
this is a good time to look for a planetarium in your area and add that in toward the end of the study when they can really have some good conversations with the people who run the planetarium. Um, number 13 says you will reevaluate. We've already talked about that. And then number 14, I just wanted to remind you that there are several families that I know that try to plan out how they're going to go from summer vacation um, into their first week of school. If you have planned an intense first week of school, that's gonna be a very abrupt change to end summer and start school. Um, some families like to back it up a week and say, what can we do during this week to help us be ready to do school more intensely? So it might be getting up at the new start time. It might be adding in some chores that you want your kids to be doing on an everyday basis. It might be adding in your first subject or two in the morning and then letting the kids have the rest of the day for their summer break. Um, the last few days of summer break. Some families get so excited about cleaning the homeschool room that the kids find the curriculum and beg their parents to get started two or three days early. That's always a pleasant surprise um, and it could happen. So just be thinking about what you could do that week before you actually are scheduled to start school. Um, the week before, what can you do? What kind of traditions do you want to start? Do you wanna go out for donuts the first day of school? Do you want to go to the zoo? What do you want to do to make your first day of school, of homeschool special? You have all the freedom in the world. You are a homeschooling family. You are in charge of your children's education and anything can count as the first day of school. You just need to put some thought into it um, and then plan out your first six weeks with one of the different systems that I've showed you or maybe something that you've found from your favorite blogger. Just think about how you can get your first six weeks scheduled out using one of these different ideas um, and get ready to start in the fall. Uh, week 24, we're going to be discussing Teaching from Rest by Sarah McKenzie. And it's a great book and I think you'll really enjoy it. So thank you very much. Have a great week.